Isaiah chapter 36. I read this post. It said, God is great. That sound good. God is great. Wow. Sounds like a Christian, right? God is great. He's wonderful. I mean, that's what they're saying. They're proclaiming it. The beer is good. The beer is good is the next statement. And people are crazy. What a statement. That, that right there, that statement alone says a lot about this individual, you know. And, you know, it, it's just crazy to live in a day and age where people think Christians can enjoy good beer and crazy people and a crazy life because that is total carnality, total carnality. And we're going to deal with that today as we see Hezekiah, uh, who was a good king, and he basically was going throughout the land, removing the altars and the idols that were in the various communities. That's a good thing because God required the Israelites to worship in Jerusalem in the temple where he had provided the priests and the offerings and everything sufficient for their salvation and their relationship with God. And yet they were building altars outside the temple in various cities so that they could worship God in their own way, offer up sacrifices when they wanted to, wherever they were at, enjoying their beer, enjoying their crazy people, and then throw a little sacrifice there in here. And Hezekiah went through and cleaned this all up, which is a good thing to do. You know. And we need to do that. I think God is going to do that here soon in this state. says just clean it all up. We've been studying Peter. You know, judgment begins in the house of God. He's going to clean all this up, this carnality. Uh, Corinthians uh, we see this carnal church and how God had to deal with the carnal church through the Apostle Paul. And so we're going to look at Hezekiah and the things surrounding his life as a king. Isaiah basically has been up to this point revealing uh, to us the judgments that are coming upon the children of Israel and also prophetically upon this world in the future here and, and maybe nearer than we think. Um, now he changes his tune a little bit to King Hezekiah and he takes uh, the story, the historical records from, uh, I think it's uh, Kings and Chronicles, and he kind of uh, retells the story of King Hezekiah. It's pertinent to what he's trying to set up here. And then in chapters 40 on, he just changes totally into a different direction, totally different directions, uh, so much so that it's almost like another writer is writing this, the, the, the second part of Isaiah. And there are those who have criticized the book of Isaiah, saying that there has been two writers, can't be the same writer, and that this second writer must have came after the time of Christ because of the things that are told are so accurate and so clear um, that it just can't be. But it is the same writer, and God had given him the insight of what would happen uh, in the future. So we'll see that next time we meet, but hopefully go through five chapters. So we'll get through this. Uh, I promise you five chapters we will. Uh, if not, <laughs> we'll, we'll get pretty close uh, because the story is pretty much just a narrative of his life. And I want to touch on a few things as we're going through all these, these scriptures and chapters. So let's start with uh, chapter uh, 36. Um, <clears throat> officials from... Uh, Hezekiah's kingdom or his government are going to meet with the Assyrian government and there's this individual, we don't know his name, but he holds the title there of Rabchecha. Rab it's a title like president or pharaoh. It's not his name, but it's a title that he holds, probably a general uh, of some sort in the army there of the Assyrians and he's representing the Assyrians as he goes to Hezekiah and his men. It says, Now it came to pass in the 14th year of King Hezekiah that Shennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. The year is about 700 B.C. during the reign of the godly king Hezekiah who was ruling over Judah, who was the northern the southern part of Israel, the northern part had broke away during the time of Solomon, and so he was a good king. The events of this chapters that are coming up are found in Second Kings chapter 18, Second Chronicles chapter 32. Good reading uh, for you to go back maybe later on tonight or at another time and read the story of Hezekiah. 
Then the king of Assyria sent Rebeshekah, again, some commander of some sort, with a great army from Lankish to King Hezekiah to, at Jerusalem. And he stood by the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. So somewhere there in Jerusalem is where this general is at, and he's going to begin to speak to the people of Hezekiah's kingdom. And Elakim, the son of Helkai, who was over the household, Sheba, the scribe, and Jonah, the son of Ashper, the recorder, came out to him. Then Rabbachakah said to them, Say now to Hezekiah. So, so he's saying this to these men, the scribes and the recorders, and they're going to go back to Hezekiah and report to him what this general is saying. Say to them, say now to Hezekiah, thus says the great king, the king of Assyria. Now, Assyria was a huge kingdom at that time. It was very powerful. Hezekiah's kingdom was not as powerful. It was a little bit smaller. They were growing in power, but not necessarily a ruling nation at the time. And so they're dealing with protecting themselves, protecting the people, protecting the temple. And they're very um, adamant about doing it in the right way, King Hezekiah is. Uh, That's the purpose of removing the altars and removing the various locations of worship and trying to centralize it back where God wanted it, and that was in the temple. And that is where we worship. We worship God in the temple. Now, we are the temple today of God, and we can worship wherever it is that we're at because of God's grace and because of God's spirit is with us always. But there's something to be said about corporate worship. When the body of Christ gathers together, and they're fellowshipping one with another and sharpening iron sword upon sword, encouraging and in prayer, and all those things that encompass us building up one another. It's so important that we fellowship within the temple of God. And, I, and I'm saying temple of God in the church itself where we gather together. It's so important that we're in that type of fellowship and that we keep that kind of fellowship. Uh, not just because of accountability, which is a good thing, right? Accountability is very good because we can so easily go astray and build an altar. We can go worship a different way. And it's so easy to do that because we stop reading the word. And we remember the stories. We hear pieces here and there on the radio. And then we start putting things together in our own way. And we're creating our own God and we're beginning to worship our God because our God is great and the beer is great. And that's our God because that's the God that we have envisioned in our mind. He wants me happy. So why not have a beer? Why not enjoy life? You know? Why not go crazy? What's wrong with that? I'm just enjoying myself. And you can begin to create this God that's really not the God of the Bible. And so fellowship is important for accountability. Uh, Also for corporate worship. When we gather together and we're worshiping, just worshiping God. God loves that. God loves to be worshiped. God, the Bible says he encompasses the praises of his people. I mean, it's like he's sitting down just, oh, it's like a a sweet smelling aroma to his nostrils and he's just taking it in. It's like going to your children's uh, choir and you're watching your child and they're singing, you know, they're off key, you know, but you're just like enjoying it and it's so beautiful and you're just like, wow, this is great. And that's how God is with us. Every one of us when we worship him. So it's so important that we fellowship there. And so he's, he's basically saying, go to your king and I want you to tell him this. Um, what confidence is this in which you trust? I say to you, verse five, I say to you, speak, of having plans and power for war, but they are mere words. Now, in whom do you trust that you rebel against me? Look, you are trusting in the the staff of this broken reed, Egypt, on which if a man leans, it will go into the hands, into his hand and and pierce it. Uh, so is Pharaoh king of Egypt to all who trust in him. So what he's basically saying is, you're trusting in Egypt. And they weren't. They were trusting in God. Egypt was having problems with Assyria, and they were crumbling also. And he's basically saying, look, you're trusting in Egypt? They don't have power. Uh, We're crushing them. So there's no way they're going to be able to help you. So for you to put your trust in them is is futile. It really won't help you at all. Um, And we can't. We shouldn't. Egypt is is a representation of the world, right? We should not be trusting in the world. We should not be trusting in psychology. That's a big issue with me is, is, is humanism and psychology. And, you know, uh, <clears throat> it's unbiblical. 
It's unbiblical. We have the word of God here that, that has been written down for thousands of years. The words that God has given to us to encourage, to strengthen us, to empower us, to bring joy, to bring peace, to bring power in our life. And yet we'll go to a man that we'll sit on a couch with and we'll throw all our garbage out about our families and how we were raised and so forth and and we will be pretty much in shackles all our life because of this this resentment and bitterness and because we can't let it go when the Bible says you need to forgive and forget and move on. I know it's difficult. I know it's hard. I know we've been hurt. I know that the pain sometimes comes up because you dwell on it so much. And God says, there is pain, and there was pain, and it was wrong, and it was sin. But it's no longer there, and you need to let it go now. You need to let God have it. Let God take care of it. And you need to trust in me. Put your faith and trust in me. I have a whole new thing for you. Because now you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Uh, that won't happen to you any longer if, as long as you set up safeguards and you don't put yourself in positions and places. I will watch over you. I promise that to you. And, and we go to these people that are just giving us human behavior. Well, statistically, we have a thousand people. And you know we know that about 500 will react this way if this situation happens. So you're probably in that group. Well, wonderful. What do I do? Well, you know, what would you like to do? <laughs> you know, well, I'd like to get better. Well, okay, well, we're here for you to get better. So how would you like to get better? You know, and it's like it's going around in circles and it never help you. You know, and, and so with Christianity, we really need to get focused on the word of God, get into the word of God and, and read all the different stories that are there, just like Hezekiah and learn from them and make good choices. We can't trust in the world, can't trust in Obama, can't trust in the Congress and the Senate. We can't trust in them at all. We shouldn't trust in government. We should trust in God and Him alone. Can't even trust your own um, spouse. Trust in God because they'll fail you too. They're only human. And that's what he's basically saying. He's telling the truth in a sense, even though he's going to attack Israel. You know, hey, they're nothing. Well, they are. They're nothing. But you, but if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away and said to Judah and Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar? Now what he's doing there is he's giving a true accusation from a worldly perspective. He doesn't understand God. And the world doesn't understand God. You go to them, you know, I, I'm in a situation right now where my brother uh, is so angry at me because he does not understand Christianity. You know, I'm called to the ministry, and for me, that comes first. Uh, if there's an event here, I am here. Uh, if there's something going on that as a man I need to be there, I will be there. I put everything else aside, and I put the ministry first. And he gets so upset because I don't go to family functions. He should quit church. <laughs> you know, like, what? I should quit church? You know, just so that I can go and be with the family and then argue in a little bit, of, you know, and get into a fight and then leave? No, it's the opposite. And they don't understand that. The world doesn't understand. That. From his perspective, he's saying, look, Hezekiah tore all the altars down. And he's forcing you to go to Jerusalem and worship? That doesn't make any sense. There's no power in your God. There's no power in God at all. Here he is, he's destroying your God. Because in his mind, he thinks that God is all these different altars too. Just like they're believing today that Allah is God. And they're telling us Allah is God. And yet these young girls who were kidnapped and going to be sell, sold as slaves for $12 a piece, and they said that it's because Allah had told them to do this. That's not my God. Allah is not my God. My God is Jehovah God, and we need to define it. We, we can't just say, God, I believe in God. Oh, you do believe in God. I believe in God, too. Yeah, my God loves beer, too. No, that's not my God. My God is not that God. My God doesn't um, like craziness, you know, lewd behavior out there. That's not the God that I serve. So we really need to define God, don't we, when we say we believe in God, when we're talking out there with people, because the athlete that plays football believes in God. Now, Tebow, you look at him and you say, yeah, he believes in God. And I'm thinking he believes in Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. But you have others, oh, yeah, I believe in God. You know, I think I remember hearing Tiger Woods say, I believe in God. You know, 
They all believe in God. All of Hollywood believes in God, but what God do they believe in? That's the question, and we really need to define that. And that's basically what he's saying here, because he has no understanding of who God is, and the world does not, and so they will not understand you, and because they persecuted him, they will persecute you. And so, and this is difficult, because it's so hard to define what Christianity is to your loved ones. Even if you do define it, they're still not going to get it. It's just too hard for them. And so what you have to do is live your life out and pray that somehow God will reach them and they'll be saved. And then when their eyes are opened up, then they'll understand what it means to be a Christian and why people are so radical with it, you know, that, that are born again, you know, that are new creatures in Christ Jesus because they know what they've been saved from. It was William Booth that said, that if God could only take each individual, tie them on a string, and hang them over hell for just a little bit, they'd come out of there a different person. Yeah. Can you imagine that? What we know of, of hell in the scriptures? How would that change you? Would it change you? Would it change you? That's really the question, right? Would it change you? Because it should change you, even though you're, you haven't been dangled over hell. You should understand you've been saved from hell. You've been saved from the pit, eternal damnation for eternity. This life on this earth is it's but a dust, a vapor. You know, I was telling my mother um, as we were talking about this situation, I said, Mom, I know that you, my sisters, are all believers, and I know I miss things. But you know what? One day, when we're all gone, we're going to spend eternity with each other forever and ever. So I look to that. I don't look to this temporal time here on this earth. On this time, I'm looking to save people. I'm looking to encourage people. I'm looking to fulfill the calling that God has put upon my life here because after here, that's it. I'm done. And then we have plenty of time to go and have a barbecue and carne asada and all those other things that you want to do, you know, because we have one relative that lives by the beach, so the thing is, let's go to the beach, let's go to the beach. It's Huntington right there by the beach, you know, so it's a big deal because they live right there by the beach, you know, so I don't care. I'd rather be here. I'd rather be doing work for the Lord. So, he, he, again, he's trying to get to them and discourage them. Now, therefore, I urge you, give a pledge to my master, the king of Syria, and I will give you two thousand horses and if you are able to on your part to uh, put riders on them uh, how then will you uh, repel one captain of the least of my master's servants and put your trust in Egypt for chariots and horsemen again what he's basically saying look I'll, I'll give you all the horses you want you're still not going to win and he's trying to discourage them in other words why don't you just give up give tribute to my master and everything will be fine uh, have I now come up Without the Lord against the land to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against the land and destroy it. Is that true? Did God speak to him? Did God speak to him? He's saying that God told him to go up to the land. Isn't it interesting how the world will say God told me to do this? I really struggle with that when God says, I told you. Or when people say, well, God told me to do this. Really? How did he tell you? I struggle. Unless I really know God told me, I, I try not to say that. And I know other people say, yeah, but, you know, if you don't say it, then the glory doesn't go to God, it goes to you. I, I, there's a battle there. I don't know. I'm not quite sure myself, you know. I, I don't want to speak for God. You know, if, if I feel God is laying, I'll say, I think God is laying this on my heart. And if it works, whew, it's God. If it doesn't, you can blame me. Then it was just me. But I don't want to use my own thoughts and mind and purposes in place of God. You know, as though God is speaking through me. You know, unless I'm really clear, uh, I think that we need to be careful of that. You know, I think we need to be careful. You know, just because people say, you know, hey, God is here because look at the size of my ministry. Look at how big it is. So God has to be here. Really? Why is that? Why does God have to be there? Now, I believe God's grace is there, and I believe God is working through that grace, but it doesn't mean that God is a part of that whole situation. Look at what happened in Florida. You know, we have an individual who, who fell from grace. 
And his ministry is humongous, humongous. It's huge, it's huge. And how many years has he been going without God? That's God's grace. Doesn't mean that God was involved in that all because of his sin. The average church, Protestant church size, average size is 65. That means you go across this nation, you go to a church, the average church is 65. That's average. So to expect anything bigger than that, you're in a big church, average-wise. The mega churches like Harvest, Costa Mesa, and we have a, quite a few in California just because it's California, but those are not the norm. Those are not the norm at all. And I, I've sat in some of those places, and they act like every church should be that big. I don't think so. I don't think so. Dave Rosales was sharing that somebody came to Chuck and, and asked him if they could do a survey of Calvary chapels and see the, the, what the average size church is in Calvary Chapel. So he went ahead and gave him the permission. The average size in Calvary Chapel is 100. So it's a little higher than the Protestants, but it's 100 people. Now, Dave was sharing this because he said that after 100, you know, you have not an average church, but above average church. And he was basically saying that that can get to your head because you think that you're doing it. And I know personally that it's not me, it's the Lord. But we have an above average church here because we have more than 100. That's above average, and that's norm, and that's typical. And probably we won't see more than that. If we do, it's God's grace, maybe two, three, four hundred. Personally, I'd like to see about 500, 600. Would be a nice, comfortable number for me that's manageable. You know, beyond that, it's scary, you know, for me. But whatever God wants, I don't want to limit him either. But it's average, you know, it's, it's an average-sized church. So just because something is huge doesn't mean that God's in it. The Mormon church is huge. Catholicism is huge. You know, we need to be careful uh, when we say things like that because they're not necessarily true. But I believe that some of these bigger churches like Harvest is a, is a blessing. It's a blessing um, because Greg teaches through the Word of God, because he reaches out to the lost, and because he discipleships, you know, people. And yet there's accusations against this church. It was J Jacob Presh who, who put out a whole video talking about Greg's ministry and how they don't make disciples of men. And I'm listening to this like... Who have you been talking to? Because you haven't been talking to Harvest or people that live around the community because, boy, he puts a lot of effort into discipleship. So whoever you're talking to, you got the wrong information, buddy. And Jacob Presh is an excellent teacher. I mean, he's a great teacher, really gets in-depth in the Hebrew. He's Jewish and the Greek and all of that stuff, but he believes someone's information, and it was a lie. So we need to be careful. Then Elakim, Sheba, and Joa said to... Rapshika, please speak to your servants in the Aramaic language, for we understand it. Do not speak to us in Hebrew in the hearing of the people who are on the wall. Um, so you get this picture as he's speaking to them. He's speaking in the Hebrew language. People are sitting on the wall, Jewish people, Israelites, and so forth, and there's the recorded and scribes, and they're listening, and the people can hear. So they say, oh, don't speak in, in Hebrew. In other words, we don't want them to hear what you're saying. We don't want them to understand because you're discouraging them, you know, who are listening. So speak to us in Aramaic so that we understand you and they don't understand you and they'll just be scratching their heads, but at least they won't be discouraged because he's trying to discourage them by speaking their language. Pretty smart that they could speak two languages. I thought that was interesting, right? I mean, I wonder how many more other languages. Maybe they spoke Egyptian also. So intelligent people. Not dumb, as some people might say, oh, the primitive people, how could they do this? They really were dumb compared to us today. I think it's the opposite. But the Rebbeshek said, has my master sent me to your master and to you to speak these words and not to men who sit on the wall who will eat and drink their own waste with you? What an interesting verse that 12 is. Uh, get that picture that demoralization that he's bringing about to them. This verse was actually used on me and another guy. We used to go out witnessing in Riverside by the bus station every Friday night, and we would sit afterwards and just discuss about what had happened and pray and just you know, talk about things like that, spiritual things. And apparently there was someone listening. And I, don't, I still to this day don't understand, but he said that he came up to us and he just gave us a scripture, Isaiah 36, 12. 
And so we opened it up right away. It's like, oh, a word from the Lord, you know. And so we opened it up and it was, it was that verse. And so we're reading it like, what, sitting on the wall who will drink and eat their own waste? What is this guy saying to us? You know, was he sitting on the wall and was he listening in? Were we discouraged? You know, so I still have no idea what this guy was saying to us. But I remember this verse so clearly because he gave it to us and it was just so confusing at the time. It almost discouraged us. It's like, well, I have no idea what he's saying. And maybe that's what it was, just a discouragement from the enemy because we were out there being active in the gospel. Verse 13, then uh, Reb Shaka, uh, stood and called out with a loud voice in Hebrew and said, Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you, nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hands of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, Make peace with me by a present In other words, pay tribute and come out to me. And every one of you eat from his own vine and every one from his own fig tree and every one of you drink the water of his own cistern until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards. What they would do is they would capture the people and then they would bring them to other places and they would assimilate them with that group. They would take them out of their own uh, community and put them in an uncomfortable place so they couldn't regroup and then fight again. And so they would just disperse them all over the place. And again, you see what he's trying to do here. He, he's discouraging them. Give up. Hezekiah can't save you. He's lying to you. How many times has the enemy done that to us? You know, oh, don't listen to your leadership. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't trust in God. You know, to discourage you. How many times has the enemy lied to you when when good instruction was given to you and yet you wouldn't listen because the enemy, oh no, they don't know what they're talking about, you know, and they discourage you that way. Be careful that you're listening to godly advice and not ungodly advice. Beware, lest Hezekiah persuade you, saying the Lord will deliver us. Has any one of the gods of the nations delivered its land from from the hand of the Assyrian king? So he's lumping up our God with their gods. Look at the other nations. Their gods didn't deliver them, so what makes you think your God's going to deliver you? Right? Where are the gods of Hamath? Arpad. Where are the gods of Shepharvim? Indeed, have they delivered the Samaria from my hand? Who among all the gods of these lands have delivered their countries from my hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem from my hand? But they held their peace and answered him, Not a word, for the king's commandment was, do not answer him. That's good advice. Sometimes it's wiser not to answer. I have found throughout my 26 years of being in ministry that sometimes I wish I just said nothing. Because you say something and it just causes an argument. And sometimes it's better to listen to them and just kind of like, mm-hmm, right, uh uh-huh, I understand, okay. Well, God bless you. (laughs) You And move on. Because as soon as you say something, there it goes. It's just like a waste of time, a waste of argument. You lose a brother. You may lose others. You know, and and it's like, it's it's not worth it. It's better just to keep your mouth shut and not say a thing. Yeah, okay, yeah, you're going to win. Yeah, we'll be destroyed. Yeah, you don't trust in our God. Yeah, our God will fail. Yeah, whatever, whatever, we'll see. And we'll just trust in God. And I wish so many times I, I would have done something like that. Yeah, you think I'm a bad pastor. Yeah, you think I do that. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah, I don't do this. Yeah, I don't Okay, we'll see. Yeah. And it's probably a lot easier. And I learned something today. Maybe that's a good lesson. We shouldn't say so much. Then Elikim, the son of Hikai, who was over the household of Sheba, the scribe, and Jonah, the son of Ashra, the recorder, came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told him the words of Ribashik. So again, um, uh, communication with the king. Now chapter 37. I don't think we're going to get through all these. We come to 37. Again, it continues on with King Hezekiah who now seeks after the Lord. He's told about what has happened. So it was when King Hezekiah heard this. He tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, went into the house of the Lord. Good thing to do. The tearing of the clothes, putting on sackcloth, humility. Lord, I have nowhere to go. I'm coming to the house of the Lord. I'm going to pray before you because I need your help. That's always a good place to go with all our needs. How, many, how, how long have you been dealing with the struggles? How long have you been dealing with an individual? Just go to the Lord in humility and let him have it. Just let him take care of it. You know? 
Don't stop dealing with it. Let God have it completely. That means that you, you take the situation and you put it in God's hands and you, you let it go and you don't think about it anymore. But wait a minute, that's insensitive. No, it's not. You're giving it to God Almighty who knows all things and can do all things. That's not insensitivity. That's wisdom. You're giving it to the, guy that, you know, to the God who will be able to handle something and you're saying, you take it, Lord. Instead of wasting our time and you know, crying and fighting and thinking about these things and it's just it's a waste of our time it's ineffectiveness and then get busy with the lord's work so he goes to the lord after this this great uh, bout of what they were going to do to them then he sent Alakim, who was over the household of Shebeth, the tribe and the elders of the priests covered with sackcloth uh, to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. And they said to him, thus says Hezekiah, this day is a day of trouble and rebuke and blasphemy for the children have come to birth, but there is no strength to bring them forth. In other words, they're weak, they're feeble. Uh, they, they're actually um, in the temple area and, and, and they're stuck there because the army's around them, basically. They can't leave. So they're running out of water, they're running out of food, and so forth. And it may be that the Lord your God will hear the words of Rebekshka, whom his master, the king of Syria, sent to reproach the living God and will rebuke the words which the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, lift up your prayers for the remnant that is left. So the servant of the king of Hezekiah came to Isaiah. So again, he's praying to the Lord. But he's, he knows that Isaiah is a prophet and he sends his men to Isaiah to pray to the Lord because he has that connection. And that's what they did in the Old Testament, right? They went to the prophets because they were connected just like with Samuel and, and so forth. In the New Testament, where, where do we go? We go to Jesus Christ. We go to the Father through Jesus Christ. He's the one that we go through who makes intercession for us on a daily basis. And so we go to Jesus Christ through, to the Father and we ask him to help us. And to pray to our Father to deliver us from these things. And Isaiah said to them, Thus says, Thus shall you say to your master, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid of the words which you have heard, with which the servant of the king of Syria have blasphemed me. Surely, so he's speaking for God, right? He blasphemed me. Surely I will send a spirit upon him, and he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword of his own land. Then Rebeshka returned and found the king of Syria warning, warring against uh, Libna, for he heard that he had departed from Lakish. <clears throat> the king heard uh, concerning Tarkishka, king of Ethiopia, he had, has come out to make war with you. So when he heard it, he sent messengers to Hezekiah, saying, Thus you shall speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Do not let your God in whom you trust deceive you, saying, Jerusalem shall not be given into the hands of the king of Assyria. Look, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all lands by utter destroying them, utterly destroying them, and you shall be delivered. Have the gods of the other nations delivered those whom the father have destroyed? Gazan, Harzin, Rizva. And the people of Eden who were in Telishar, where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, the king of the city of Sepharium, Hena, and Iva? And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of his messenger and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. Again, great thing to do. The enemy is relentless. He's like a roaring lion and he's going to keep coming at you. What do you do? You take it right back to the Lord. You just spread it before the throne of God. That's the best thing to do. He's waiting for you to do this. He's waiting for you to go, all right, all right, I get you. I give up. I'm tired. I, I can't keep going to God. It's just not working. He's not listening to me. And so I give up. I'm just whatever. Go ahead, do it. And, and you end up getting into a worse situation you have to learn to continue to go to God on a daily basis as many times as it needs you can't stop because prayer does work and we'll see that in a minute here that prayer does work and we need to go to God with everything no matter how many times the enemy comes at us you know uh, the armor of God the the shield of faith right it says take up the shield of faith by which you will repel the fiery darts of the enemy he's going to throw darts at you you can just take the shield of faith and just keep using it retarding those fiery darts let them hit it and move away and you just battle that way constantly before the the lord 
And sometimes it's the same prayer. 26 years, and I, I'll lay here at the, sometimes and just praying to the Lord, and it's the same prayer. Lord, I need you again. I need your strength. I need your help. And it's always the same thing because we need it on a daily basis. When Jesus taught the disciples how to pray, it was meet our daily needs, right? And give us our daily bread. It wasn't give us the whole month and the whole year. It was give us what we need daily, Lord. Why? Because God loves us coming to him on a daily basis. He doesn't want to see us once in a while. He wants to see us every day. You know, well, we'll see you next Friday, Reuben. You know, uh, we'll see you then when you're in trouble, and then we'll we'll talk then. You know, he wants you every morning uh, to get up and read and and pray and just seek him and talk to him on a daily basis. It's good for us to do that. It strengthens us at all times. So he spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, saying, "O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, <clears throat> the one who dwells between the cherubim." You are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made the heavens. And I love the way he prays here. Uh, we, we should read this over again and learn how to pray like that. You know, he's, a, he's basically saying, you're God of everything. You sit on the throne. You create the heavens and the earth. That excites you when you realize who your God is. You're not a wooden idol. You're not a, a poor man's idol. See, a rich man's idol was gold, and he would make a gold image and mold it. But a poor man who had no gold, he'd make his God out of hard wood that wouldn't, you know, uh, wear away too easily. But he had an idol, and that was his God. No, our God is the one who created the gold and the wood and the heavens and so forth. Our God is awesome. Incline your ear, he said, O Lord, and hear, open your eyes, O Lord, and see, and hear all the words of the king of Assyria, which is, which he has sent to reproach the living God. Now, whose battle is it? King Hezekiah's? No. He's approaching you, Lord. He's standing against you, not us. And so what are you going to do about it, <laughs> basically? What are you going to do about it? That's what Hezekiah is saying. God, they're attacking you. So what are you going to do about it? Lord, they're not attacking me. They're unsaved. They don't know what they believe. They don't know what they're doing. They're attacking you. So what are you going to do? And so we can let God handle it, and he can handle it just fine. What are you going to do, Lord? Truly, Lord, the king of Assyria has laid waste all the nations in their land, cast their gods into the fires, and they were not gods, but the work of man's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they have destroyed them. Now, therefore, Lord, our God, save us from the hand that all the kings of the earth may know that you are the Lord, you alone. Then I, I love that because then God gets the glory, right? You do it, Lord, So that everyone knows that it's you who have done it. And there's no question about it. Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, because you have prayed to me against Shennacherib, king of Assyria, this is the word which the Lord has spoken concerning him. The virgin, the daughters of Zion, has despised you, despised you, laughed you to scorn. The daughters of Jerusalem have shaken her head behind your back. Whom have you reproached and blasphemed? Against whom have you raised your voice and lift up your eyes on high against the Holy One of Israel? By your servant you have reproached the Lord and said, By the multitude of my chariots I have come up to, fi- to the heights of the mountains, to the limits of Lebanon. I will cut down its tall cedars and its choice cypress trees. I will enter its furthest heights to its fruitful forests. I have dug and drunk water with the sole of my feet, I've dried up all the brooks of defense. Did you not hear long ago how I made it from ancient times that I formed it? Now I have brought it to pass that you should be far for crushing fortified cities into heaps of ruin. Therefore, their inhabitants had little power. They were dismayed and confounded. They were as the grass of the field and the green herb, as the grass on the housetop and grain be lighted before it is grown. But I know your dwelling place. You're going out and you're coming in. Your rage against me because your rage against me and your torment has come up to my ears. Therefore, I will put my hook in your nose and my bridle in your lips and I will turn you back by the way which you came. This shall be a sign to you, that is to Hezekiah, you shall eat this year such as grow of itself, and the second year which springs from the same, 
Also in the third year sow and reap, plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. And the remnant who has escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant and those who escape from Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into the city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor build a siege mount against it by the way that he came. By the same shall he return. He shall not come into the city, says the Lord, for I have defended the city to save it for my own sake, for my servant David's sake. So what did the Lord do? Look at the next verse. And the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. Then the king of Assyria departed and went away, returned home and remained at Nineveh. Now it came to pass as he was worshiping in the house of Nishroth, his God, that his sons... Ademelech, Shazer, struck him down with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Erat. Then Eshkerhaddon, the son, reigned in his place. Did God take care of it? He sure did, didn't he? He said, don't worry about it. This is what's going to happen, and it's exactly what happened. I said, you don't have to worry about it. No one's going to be taken. A remnant will be there. You'll be fruitful for one, two, three years, and there won't be any worry. And... The Bible tells us that it was an angel that did it, 185,000, just like that. Now, that's interesting because you have to ask, how did that happen? How did it happen? Did an angel come down with a sword and, and then you find all these men chopped up, you know, holes in them? Did they all have heart attacks? You know, it doesn't say. I wish I was there. I, wanted, I, I would like to see 185,000 men just fall over, you know, by one angel. That's power. That is power. And you think God can't take care of you. Why would you think that? You think God can't defend you, but he can. Why would you think that? Because the enemy puts it in our thoughts. Don't believe in your God. He can't take care of you. Where has he been? Look at how long it's been. Don't trust in him. No, we can trust in him and we can believe in him and not believe the lies of the enemy. Chapter 38 the mercy of God to Hezekiah. Um, <clears throat> it says, In those days Hezekiah was sick and near to death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Um, probably before the deliverance here, they believed that he got sick and he was dying. And the prophet says, it's time to set your house in order. It's spiritually speaking, is what he's talking about. Not, okay, make our finances assure, we make our living will and our trust. No, make sure you're right with the Lord, your wife's right with the Lord, your children are right with the Lord. Make sure that you've done everything right according to God's word. That's important. Before you leave this earth, make sure you do everything right. The great, it's the last opportunity that we have. You know, as we get older, we have less opportunities to serve the Lord because life gets shorter. Life becomes more of a burden. At least I've noticed that. You know, your body becomes more of a burden. You spend more time at the doctors than you do at home sometimes you know, because of the injuries and the illnesses. And so it's harder to keep things in order. And so that's why it's important that we keep things in order as we get older. Um, you know, I have a living trust. I actually got a living trust. Uh, I got blessed by it because somebody uh, actually took me to a lawyer out in San Diego. We went out there. I figured we were going to pay about $1,500 for it. And the guy actually uh, at the time has, has been well known in the Calvary chapels. And so we got to talking. I think Roman went with us one time. And uh, he just blessed us. He says, it's here. It's done. Like, what? He goes, yeah, no charge. Like, oh, wow, thank you, brother. But I have a living trust, so everything that I have is in this living trust. And I've set it in order, so, so the first thing that happens, so all my boys know all this, the first thing that happens with everything I own, 10% goes to the Lord. It goes here first to this church, and, if it, and I leave it up to my boys. If they don't like the guy that's here, they can send it to Costa Mesa. <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, that's what I, I put in there. You know. uh, 
course, hopefully it's, it's one of my sons or somebody that we all know, you know. But if not, it goes to Costa Mesa, you know. Or, or part of it goes here and then part of it goes to Costa Mesa because Chuck has always said you want to invest where the Spirit is moving. You know? And so I believe that, and I know the Spirit's always moving in Costa Mesa. So I want to make sure that my money that I've worked so hard for, that 10% is going to go to Costa Mesa or here, and that when I get to heaven, the rewards are there waiting for me, you know, because that's where I want to send it and set things in order. You know, so important. And then the rest goes to the boys. They all get 50, 50, 50, 50, whatever's, you know, left over. Of course, as I get older, not much is going to be left over because <laughs> I seem to be using it up. So, um, so set your house in order. Then Hezekiah turned his face towards the wall, and prayed to the Lord and said, Remember now, O Lord, I pray, how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah whipped bitterly. Now remember, Hezekiah is living under the old covenant, under the law. And under the old covenant, you had to follow the law. And you were righteous by following the law. So he's depending, uh, he's putting his righteousness on what he has done, basically, right? And so the Bible said in Deuteronomy chapter 28, believe the curses and blessings that if you follow my law, you'll be blessed. If you don't follow my law, you'll be cursed. And what he's saying is, look, Lord, you've seen my righteousness. You see how I have followed your law to the best of my ability. You know, I have tried to keep it and so forth. And so he's not boasting that he's perfect. That's not what he's doing here. That's the covenant that he's under. For us today, we don't follow the law. When we come before God, it's Lord, we're coming before you. you. You've seen your son and what he's done for us. You see the blood that was shed. And so, Lord, you see his work. And so have grace on us. Have mercy on us. And that's basically what he's saying here with the law. <clears throat> I will deliver you and this city from the hands of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city. Oh, I'm sorry, did I skip one? Yeah, I did. And the word of the Lord, verse 4, and the word of the Lord came to Isaiah saying, Go and tell Hezekiah, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Surely I will add to your days 15 years. So prayer works. Lord, I followed your law. I've been righteous before you. And he's crying. He's a grown man. Here's a king. And he's crying. He's weeping because he's ill. Good question. He's ill. He doesn't want to die yet. Not sure about heaven, right? Not sure about eternal salvation. They weren't back then. They didn't understand it. Where was he going when he died? They, don't, they didn't understand it all. So we know they went to Abraham's bosom because Jesus came and then set them free to go to paradise, heaven. And so, But he didn't understand all that. So yeah, I want to live. I don't, don't kill me now. I've just got started, you know. Please, and he's crying and he's weeping and, and, and so forth. And the Lord hears him and says, okay, I'm adding 15 more years to you. I heard your prayers. 15 more years. Now what does he do with that 15 more years? That's the big question. What do you do with the, the grace amount of time that God gives you? What are you doing with it? I hope it's glorifying God. <clears throat> I hope it's serving him you know, it's not what he does unfortunately and unfortunately it's not what a lot of us do a lot of us start to live like wow I got a second chance let me try to get all my what, what's that list that everyone has the, is it called a bucket list so, I don't know how to remember these things because I never even you know like I got to get my bucket list you know and whatever that is Jump off a bridge on a bungee cord, you know, at 85 years old. They're not got that bucket list done. You know, you know, you know, you know, let it be a bucket list with the things of God in there. I'd like to go on a missions trip, a short missions trip one of these days. You know, I'd like to go to Israel. You know, I'd like to, you know, something like that. And unfortunately, we don't, we don't think that. We, we think about, let's have fun before we go to heaven. Man, heaven is going to be so great, you know, it's going to be so awesome, you're going to be blown away by it. We can't even imagine what it's going to be like, you know. That's where the fun is going to come. Let's get busy with God now. I will deliver you, uh, added upon that, I'll deliver you the city from the hands of the Assyrians and defend the city. And this is the sign 
uh, to you from the Lord that the Lord will do this thing which he has spoken. Behold, I will bring the shadow on the sundial which has gone down with the sun on the sundial of Ahaz 10 degrees backwards. So the sun returned 10 degrees, which is about, they calculated, 45 minutes on the dial which is had. Now, what a miracle that is. <laughs> Did God have to do that? No, healing me and giving me 15 years is pretty good. That's enough of a sign, but he throws in another sign. Tell you what, Hezekiah, look at the sundown, and I'm actually going to make it go backwards. How did he do that? It's a miracle. You know, people don't believe in miracles, but yet it happened. The sun actually went backwards, or the earth shifted its rotation and then started up again. Who knows? We don't know. It doesn't say. It just says that that's what God did. And Hezekiah saw it and said, whoa, this is the God I serve. Now, that should blow you away. That should make you want to do something for the Lord. That's the whole response thing of salvation, isn't it? We get saved. We realize we're sinners and we're wretched people because we realize that what we have done in the past, done in our lives, done to people, done in situations, taking drugs, you know, all of these things. And then God comes in and shows his grace. And you go, I get eternal life. And he wipes my slate clean. Man, Lord, what do you want me to do for you? I will clean toilets. Who am I? I will clean toilets for you for the rest of my life. That's appreciation for the Lord. When God does something for you, that's the natural outcome that should take place in our lives for the salvation that God has given to us. And every time God's grace is poured upon us, it should make us not to pay back debt because we could never pay back. We're indebted to Christ for the rest of our lives, but to be appreciative of what he has done for us. And so we want to live a good life for him. We want to live righteous. We want to live pure lives. We don't want to live carnal lives in this world. We want to live for him. And to turn the dial back 45 degrees just a sign for you? Wow. That's amazing. Our God is awesome. And this is the writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah. So now he writes, When he had been sick and had recovered from his sickness, I said, In the prime of my life I shall go to the gates of Sheol, that is, to hell. I am deprived of the remainder of my years. I said, I shall not see uh, the Lord in the land of the living, I shall observe man no more among the inhabitants of the world. My lifespan is gone, taken from me like a shepherd's tent. I have cut off my life like a weaver. He cuts me off from the loom, from the day until night. You make an end of me. I have considered until morning like a lion. So he breaks all my bones from day until night. You make an end of me like a crane or a, a shallow, shallow swallow. Swallow, it was hard for me to swallow. <clears throat> swallow, so I chattered. I mourned like a dove. My eyes fell from looking upward. Oh Lord, I am oppressed, undertaken for me. So you see his hopelessness while he was sick. And that's what he wrote. There's no hope for me. God's just totally brought me to an end of my life. And then he gets healed and this is what he says. What shall I say? He has well spoken to me and he himself has done it. I shall walk carefully all my years in the bitterness of my soul. O Lord, all or by these things men live and all these things is my life in my spirit. So you uh, will restore me and make me live. Indeed, it was for my own peace that I had great bitterness, but you have lovingly delivered my soul from the pit of corruption for you have cast all my sins behind your back. For Sheol cannot thank you. Death cannot praise you. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your truth. The living, the living man, shall, he shall praise you as I do this day. The Father shall make known your truth to the children. The Lord has ready to, was ready to save me. Therefore, we will sing my song with string instruments all the days of our life in the Lord's house. And Isaiah had said, let them take a lump of figs and apply it as a pole ice on the boil and he shall recover. And Hezekiah had said, what is the sign that I shall go up to the house of the Lord? Let's go ahead and get 39 because 39 is eight verses. So it will go by very quickly. Now this is where he fails. At the time, Merodach, 
Baladin, the son of Baladin, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that he had been sick and he had recovered. So good gesture of respect there. Though Hezekiah wasn't a great kingdom, but this Babylon, which is greater, sends his respects. Hezekiah was pleased with them and showed them the house of the treasures, the silver, the gold, the spices, present precious ointments and all his armory. All that was found among his treasures, there was nothing in his house or in all his dominion that Hezekiah did not show him. That definitely was not something to do. You do not show what you have to your enemy, especially your wealth like that. This is foolish pride right here. He probably felt, wow, he sent me a letter, a little gift. Hmm, let me show him what I got. And so he began to show his men everything that the Lord had blessed him with. And that was a dumb move. You know, don't tell everybody everything. You don't have to do that. You know, you don't have to tell everybody everything about you. You know, those, those things may offend others. They may be things that people can use against you, you know, and so forth. I remember years ago when I first started this ministry, I shared something with a brother. And he looked at me like, wow. There's something wrong with you. You sure you need, you sure you're called to be a pastor? I'm like, wow. It's like I never should have shared that with him. You know, you need to be careful. You need to be careful. You can have a private life. There's nothing wrong with having a private life. I'm not saying a sinful private life. I'm just saying a private life. You may have indulgences that are are okay. You have liberties to do so, but others may not have those liberties. Don't stumble them. Don't Give them an opportunity to accuse you either. Watch what you're doing. Watch what you're saying. Do it in the privacy of your own home when no one else is around. If you have those liberties. But other than that, don't be showing everybody all that stuff. You don't need to. Because your enemy is going to come and attack you. The devil definitely will use it against you. So you need to be careful with that. He wasn't careful. He showed them all the gold, all the riches. And of course, what's going to happen? They're going to come and take it. Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men say? And where did they come to you? So Hezekiah said, They came to me from the far country, from Babylon. And he said, What have they seen in your house? And he already knew. It's like the Lord sent Isaiah down. and Go down there and, you knucklehead, <laughs> what did you do? So Hezekiah answered, They have seen it all that is in my house. There is nothing among my treasures that have not been shown to them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And they shall take away some of your sons who will descend will descend from you, whom you will beget, and they shall be eunuchs in the palaces of the kings of Babylon. So Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord which has spoken is good. For he said, at least there will be peace and truth in my days. <laughs> he, he's like, oh, my, I'll let my grandchildren take care of it. It's like our, our country, right? Well, let's let our child, children's children take care of the taxes. You know, that's not the way to think. So God said, no, you've done a wrong thing here and um, your children are going to pay for it. And this is where Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they get taken into captivity. So he didn't finish well, did he? He didn't finish well. Finish well. Finish well. Let Let me close with this. When I was in high school, I used to love running. I always loved running. Even as an elementary kid in junior high, I would run, 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 run. And even as an adult, before I got injured, I'd run five miles a day, sometimes ten miles a day. I just loved running. It was just in me. And I remember going to an invitational. And at that time, I met my wife, junior high, and then we hooked up in in ninth grade right after um, prom. And I started hanging around her more than running because I liked her more than running. Only thing I ever liked more than running was her. And so I noticed that I didn't go to the practices as much. I didn't run on my own as much. And I was hanging around her too much. and got me into much trouble. (laughs) And so um, I remember being at this invitational. And it was the first time that I had an opportunity to win a medal. And I was was like the sixth guy is what I was told. You're the sixth guy. One more guy. You got a medal. I'm like, wow. 
And so I was running, and I saw him right up above, and I got to get that guy. And I was running, and now he's getting closer and closer and closer. One more guy, and it was in me. I got to get this medal. I mean, I was going for the medal, going for the medal. Now, they were all bunched up because these were the best of the best, and they were, you know, the first five were bunched up. They were, you know, competing. I caught that guy, and I said to myself, I've got the medal. I've got the medal. And so I started coasting. There were two, three guys right there in front. And I started coasting, boom, boom, boom. One, two, three, four, five. And then I was six. The guy couldn't count. He couldn't count. I missed the medal by one. Because I didn't finish the race. I didn't finish the race. I thought I had it. I was deceived. You know, I didn't. Finish the race well. Finish to win. Not just to get a medal. Finish to win. Run with all your heart and give it all unto the Lord. Because we only have this amount of time in this earth.